Hey y'all. Recently a co-worker asked me for some heist film recommendations. I recommended he watch the film Inside Man, starring Denzel Washington and Clive Warren and directed by Spike Lee, because I enjoy the style of this film. It's a nice mix of comedy and thrills. Anyway, after my co-worker watched the film, he commented on the name of Spike Lee's production company, 40 Acres and a Mule Filmworks, sarcastically saying that of course Spike Lee thinks he's entitled to that. 40 Acres and a Mule, for those of you who don't know, refers to the idea that freedmen were to be given 40 acres of land plus a mule after they were emancipated. I myself have noticed that most people don't actually know the history behind that phrase or why that idea was so important, so this video is going to explain the origins of the phrase and explain why that phrase is still relevant today. First, we need to briefly examine the first half of the Civil War. In the spring of 1862, Congress passed the Second Confiscation Act. This act allowed the confiscation of any property of supporters of the Confederacy through legal proceedings, and any slaves, which were considered property, that fell into the control of the Union Army were emancipated. This act was controversial for two reasons. First, many in Congress were unsure as to whether or not confiscation of property was even constitutional, and second, Abraham Lincoln did not support the permanent confiscation of property of traitors, to the point that he would have vetoed the bill if it passed Congress without his resolution addressing this concern. The reason that Lincoln did not support permanent confiscation was because this action would be a corruption of the blood, meaning that the children of those convicted of treason would not be able to inherit their parents' property, which violates Article 3, Section 3, Paragraph 2 of the United States Constitution. In late 1864, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman's famous march to the sea takes place, disrupting Confederate supply lines and weakening the morale of Southern whites. One of the consequences of the march to the sea was that thousands of recently freed slaves followed Sherman's march in need of nourishment and protection. Sherman needed a way to care for these freedmen. On January 12, 1865, Sherman and Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton met with 20 Southern black ministers asking them questions about their opinion of recent events and the foreseeable future for freedmen. Here are two of the questions asked, with Garrison Fraser, a former slave who had bought his freedom in 1858, giving the responses. State in what manner you think you can take care of yourselves, and how you best assist the government in maintaining your freedom. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land, and turn it and till it by our own labor, that is, the labor of the women and children and old men, and we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. And to assist the government, the young men should enlist in the service of the government, and serve in such a manner as they may be wanted. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. State in what manner you would rather live, whether scattered among the whites or in colonies by yourselves. I would prefer to live by ourselves, for there is a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over, but I do not know that I can answer for my brethren. As we can see here, freedmen wanted their own land, separated from Southern whites, that they would be able to work on and eventually purchase for themselves. Four days later, Sherman issued Special Field Orders Number 15, which appropriated land 30 miles back from the coast in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, containing crop fields that had largely been abandoned or seized by this point in the Civil War. This amounted to about 400,000 acres of land in total. Abolitionist and Brigadier General Rufus Saxon was put in charge of the redistribution of land. The land was to be divided into plots of no more than 40 acres to be farmed by freedmen, and whites would not be permitted to settle in this area. This is partially the origin of the phrase, 40 acres and a mule, though the mule was not part of the order. The Union Army later provided some extra mules to freedmen, which is where the mule fits into this story. At the end of January 1865, the House of Representatives passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery except in the case of punishment. In March of 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau Bill established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, or Freedmen's Bureau for short, tasked with assisting blacks with their transition into freedom and ensuring peace between blacks and whites. On April 9th, Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, ending the Civil War, and a mere six days later, Lincoln dies after having been shot by John Wilkes Booth. Nearly 200,000 black men served in both the Union Army and Navy with blacks making up 10% of the entire Union Army. The majority of these men were former slaves, who further supported the Union Army by denying the Confederacy access to a valuable resource, their labor. Speaking of labor, black men and women also supported the war effort in non-combat roles such as cooks, nurses, scouts, and teamsters. It is important to remember that white people did not just give blacks their freedom. Blacks also fought bravely in order to guarantee their freedom even if the whites did not respect them as recalled by a colonel during the war. 
I have the honor to forward herewith a report of the operations of a detachment of the 5th U.S. Colored Cavalry. They have been drawn with the intention of using them only for the purpose of drilling. On the march, the colored soldiers as well as their white officers were made the subject of much ridicule and many insulting remarks by the white troops and in some instances petty outrages such as the pulling off of the caps of colored soldiers, stealing their horses, etc. But in no instance did I hear colored soldiers make any reply to insulting language used towards them by the white troops. On the second day of October, Colonel Wade ordered his force to charge, and the Negroes rushed upon the works with a yell, and after a desperate struggle, carried the entire line, killing and wounding a large number of the enemy, and capturing some prisoners. Of this fight, I can say that men could not have behaved more bravely. I have seen white troops fight in 27 battles, and I never saw any fight better. On the return of the forces, those who had scoffed at the colored troops on the march out were silent. After the end of the Civil War, the topic of whether these confiscated lands were to remain confiscated came up again. Sherman did not have the authority to permanently give land to freedmen, and later stated that the land confiscation was meant to be temporary. The Freedmen's Bureau attempted to solve this problem. The Bureau, then headed by Oliver O. Howard, initially helped blacks by giving them rations and by attempting to help them locate family members, some of whom they had not seen in decades. The Bureau also served as a fair court system and provided freedmen with schools, teachers, and books. By July, the Bureau had accumulated 850,000 acres of confiscated land and began distributing this land among freedmen, issuing out plots of 40 acres to them and giving them three years to purchase it outright. Many freedmen anticipated receiving a share of the land and the opportunity to prosper as free people. Much like the black ministers, Howard wanted blacks to be able to support themselves by working their own land. However, President Andrew Johnson had his own plans in regards to Reconstruction. He gave amnesty to all Southerners except the wealthiest of planters. Planters who had more than $20,000 in land would only receive a pardon if they personally went to Johnson himself and took a loyalty oath. All Southerners received their land back with virtually no punishment at all. Why was Johnson so lenient? Well, Johnson himself was a Southern Democrat. He believed that the planters, people who were the Southern upper class, the capitalists of the South, were to blame for the Civil War. Johnson had grown up impoverished in North Carolina before his political career. He hated the wealthy planters who never accepted him as one of their own, but he saw the poor Southern whites as the primary victims of Southern capitalists, rather than the true primary victims, enslaved blacks. Without land of their own, freedmen would effectively cease to be free, because they would have no choice but to return to the plantations from which they had been emancipated and seek employment. Black Union soldiers expressed this concern. Man that have stood upon the field of battle and have shot their master and sons, now going to ask either one for bread or for shelter or for comfort for his wife and children. Such a thing the United States should not ought expect a man. Run right out of slavery and the soldiery, and we had nothing at all, and our wives and mothers, and most a lot of them, are perishing all about where we leave them. Property and all the lands that will be sold cheap will be gone, and we will have a hard struggle to get along in the United States. And what of those who did return? This account from a freed slave to return to work for her former master reflects the treatment many former slaves received from their new employers. My mistress came out and asked me if I came back to work for her like a... I told her no, that I was free, and she said be off then, and called me a stinking bitch. I afterwards wore 40 yards of dress goods for her that she promised to pay me for, but she never paid me a cent for it. I have asked for it several times. Brigadier General Saxton who worked for the Freedmen's Bureau after the Civil War, opposed Johnson's decision and refused to authorize the transfer of land back to white planters. Though he was later removed from this position, his delay did help a few freedmen keep hold of their new land. The Freedmen's Bureau, however, was not perfect. The Freedmen's Bureau decided to help employ blacks in low-paying one-year contracts, usually with their former masters. The Bureau did this with the intention of fostering a peaceful relationship between black employees and white employers. What resulted was decades of sharecropping for many blacks. Sharecropping is when a landowner allows laborers without their own land to work on provided farm plots, with laborers being paid a share of the crop at harvest. Laborers were typically given a share of the crop, as opposed to a money wage, because landowners only had to pay laborers when the harvest came in, and it gave workers an incentive to produce a high crop yield. However, there were disputes over whether an employment contract applied to one person or the entire family. The Freedmen's Bureau favored that the entire family worked, while married black women did not want to work. Planters typically put as many laborers as possible in as small a farm plot as possible. 
This was much more efficient and provided planters with much more profit but decreased the share of the crop per laborer. Black laborers were aware of this and surprisingly did organize to a limited degree. Laborers came together in a sort of union and laid out standard terms of employment to which all the laborers would agree. Laborers who agreed to work for less than the agreed upon terms risked ostracization and sometimes violence. This tactic was successful in increasing the share offered by planters from the Freedmen Bureau's specified amounts of one-fourth or one-third to one-half. These groups included paramilitary organizations of blacks from various plantations who assembled and were armed, as many freemen were veterans and had kept their weapons from the Civil War. The Southern white reaction to armed blacks was to be expected. I wish to call your attention to a serious and growing evil, and you will give it your earliest midst. The Negro soldiery here are constantly telling our Negroes that for the next year, the government will give them lands, provisions, stock, and all things necessary to carry on business for themselves. Strange to say, the Negroes believe such stories, in spite of facts to the contrary told to them by their employers. Furthermore, I have good cause to believe that our Negroes are told that when the soldiers are withdrawn, that the whites will endeavor to enslave them again, and that they are urged to begin at an early day, perhaps about Christmas, a massacre of the whites, in order to ensure their freedom. Get the Negro soldiery removed from our midst, and no danger will follow. Let the soldiery remain, they will endeavor by universal massacre to turn this fair land into another Haiti. Most of the former Confederate politicians, many of whom were slave owners themselves, and had helped the southern states secede from the Union, were pardoned and free to return to politics, which they did. In November of 1865, Mississippi introduced a Black Code, a set of laws that effectively brought slavery back to the state. The laws forbade blacks from owning land outside of cities or carrying weapons, required that blacks prove employment at the beginning of each year, levied a black-only tax, and allowed the state to take custody of children of black parents who couldn't support their families. Blacks who did not prove their employment or ran away would be considered vagrants, arrested, and contracted out to planters who would pay their fines and force the prisoner to work to pay off said fine, while children removed from their families were given back to the planters that had previously owned them. Mississippi even went as far as to implement a law forcing whites to return runaway black workers to their employees, effectively reinstating fugitive slave laws. Much like slave codes, other southern states saw these laws as a blueprint for their own laws, passing their own black codes shortly after. The end of 1865 saw Congress reconvene without secession of states and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It also saw the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. It was becoming clear that President Johnson favored southern states deciding the fate of freedmen, and southern Democrats would see to the worst possible future for them. The nation caught a glimpse of this future on May 1st, 1866, in Memphis, Tennessee. Around 6 o'clock, I saw boys and men with pistols firing at every black man they could see. They shot them down as fast as they could come to them. Four policemen attempted to break up a street party of black soldiers, which resulted in a riot. When the police were forced to retreat, they returned with an armed white mob and proceeded to shoot any black soldiers they could find. Unsatisfied, the mob set their sights on black homes. They killed all the black men they could find and raped black women. The mob burned down black houses, sometimes trapping blacks within their burning homes. After three days of chaos, 46 blacks lay dead. 89 homes and every black church and school lay in soot and ashes. Nearly two months later, another riot broke out in front of the New Orleans Mechanics Institute. Blacks and Republicans convened to plan growth in Louisiana and the removal of the oppressive black codes. While the blacks were marching in the street, they were confronted by armed Southern Democrats. Here is a graphic account of the event. The whites stomped, kicked, and clubbed the black marchers mercilessly. Policemen smashed the Institute's windows and fired into it indiscriminately until the floor grew slick with blood. They emptied their revolvers on the convention delegates, who desperately sought to escape. Some leapt from windows and were shot dead where they landed. Those lying wounded on the ground were stabbed repeatedly, their skulls bashed in with brickbats. The sadism was so wanton that men who kneeled and prayed for mercy were killed instantly, while dead bodies were stabbed and mutilated. Johnson's Reconstruction was a reconstruction of the same racist and economic political power structures that had oppressed African Americans in the antebellum South, only replacing chattel slavery with sharecropping. This was not Reconstruction. This was restoration. Much of the land of wealthy plantation owners should not have been returned to them. The wealth that slave owners had accumulated was from the exploitation and enslavement of blacks, and former slaves were entitled to a share of that wealth. Over 180,000 blacks, most of which were former slaves, served the United States and helped preserve this union. 
and yet after the war, most of them were forced to return to their former masters for employment. Giving blacks their own land to farm would have given them the opportunity to develop their own economic independence and wealth. Since the end of the Civil War, Americans have witnessed various legislation, landmarks, Supreme Court cases, and programs that were supposed to support the elimination of the gap between blacks and whites, including the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, Brown v. Board of Education, Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, and Affirmative Action, just to name a few. While many of these things have made a large difference in American society, African Americans are still negatively affected disproportionately by capitalism, the criminal justice system, the education system, employment, housing, wealth, and voting, just to name a few. Institutional racism still remains the greatest obstacle to the progress of African Americans in the United States. Which brings me to the Democratic debates. 2019 has seen the revival of the debate over reparations in the United States. Reparations, if you are unaware, is the idea that the descendants of African slaves should receive compensation for the enslavement of their ancestors. The recent revival of this debate largely stems from the Democratic campaigns for president, with many candidates being in favor of reparations or at least open to the idea of some form of reparations. Marianne Williamson has by far invested the most thought into reparations, wanting somewhere between $200 and $500 million, at least as of this recording. By the way, these ideas are not merely limited to just give black people a bunch of money. There are proposals for researching the best methods for reparations, including the idea of creating programs to support African Americans, similar to affirmative action. The descendants of slaves are not owed reparations because their ancestors did not receive 40 acres and a mule. They are owed reparations because the United States failed to provide most African Americans with the opportunity to create better lives for themselves. Much like Johnson did during presidential reconstruction, the United States has often ignored African Americans' requests for support or created barriers for equal treatment or representation. Reparations has the opportunity to address these past failures. However, any plan that does not include eliminating institutional racism will only treat the symptoms of the problem and not the problem itself. Thanks for watching. If you want to support this channel, you can like, leave an encouraging comment, or subscribe. If for some reason you would like to financially support me, consider supporting these creators instead. Do Not Eat, Jet Cloud, Jose, Mad Blender, and Mia Mulder. Their videos have influenced me to start this channel, so by supporting them, you are helping them make more content, which also inspires me to make more content. It may sound weird, but just trust me. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one.